Welcome to Equation Stripped, where in each video I take some of the most important equations in maths and strip them back layer by layer so that hopefully everyone can understand what they mean. This week we're looking at the most beautiful equation in maths, Euler's identity. The reason this equation is deemed so beautiful is the fact that it's so short and so simple and yet it captures some of the most complex behaviour in the whole of maths. And a study was actually done a few years ago by a team of neuroscientists. And basically they took a group of mathematicians and put them inside an fMRI scanner, which showed activity in their brain. And then they showed them maths equations and actually found that the same part of your brain that sort of buzzes and lights up when you see a great work of art or you hear a beautiful piece of music that same part of your brain will actually light up when you see a beautiful mathematical equation. And this equation, Euler's identity, was actually deemed to be the most beautiful of all of the maths equations. So why is this equation so important, as well as being beautiful? Well, to start with, our first layer is the fact that the equation actually has five constants in there, five mathematical constants or five numbers. So you have e, you have i, pi, 1, and 0. And these five constants are pretty much the five most important mathematical constants in existence. And they're all there in this one equation. And it's just so elegant and so beautiful. It's just these five constants with a plus and an equals. 2.7182 plus a load of other numbers. It goes on forever. And E is my favourite number. And it pops up everywhere when you're thinking about growth. So growth rates and rate of change of objects or variables. E is sort of the natural rate of change that just pops up everywhere. Our next number is pi. So pi is 3.1415, again, goes on forever. And you can define pi as the circumference of a circle, the distance all the way around the edge, divided by the diameter, so the distance across the circle where you pass through the middle point. Anything to do with circles, which by extension, anything to do with spheres, pi appears, and because lots of things in our universe are spherical, then pi comes up everywhere in maths and physics. So this is i, which is the square root of minus one. This might seem a bit alien to, to some of you, but like you can calculate the square root of 4 as 2. So 2 times 2 gives you 4. 3 times 3 gives you 9. So 2 is the square root of 4. 3 is the square root of 9. You're basically saying what number times itself gives you that, that number. So for minus 1, with real numbers, as they're called, you cannot work out the square root of a negative number. We just don't have it. It doesn't exist in maths. So what we did as mathematicians was to invent an imaginary number, which we call i. This math is great. If you've got a problem, you can just invent a number to, to fix it. i is the square root of minus 1, which means that i times i gives you minus 1. So now you can get the square root of any negative number. So for example, the square root of minus 9 is going to be 3i, because 3 times 3 is 9, i times i is minus 1, 9 times minus 1, minus 9. For the second layer of our equation that we now stripped back to, we need to think about series and the way in which mathematical functions are defined. So this might get a little technical, but bear with me, it will all make sense. And there are three functions in particular that we want to consider. And I've written them out here. So we have at the top, we've got sine, we've got cosine, and then we've got the exponential function. So sine and cosine are the usual functions you've hopefully heard of from trigonometry at school, um, Soka, Toa, or silly old Harry, Corta Herring, trawling over America. That's how I used to remember it. They are mathematical functions. They will tell you how the angles in a triangle relate to the lengths of the sides of that triangle. But they also can be defined like this. So sine of any number, x, is equal to the number minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the fifth over 5 factorial, etc. And this carries on with the same pattern. And the factorial here just means the number 
times all the ones below it. So 3 factorial is 3 times 2 times 1. 5 factorial, 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Why we use an exclamation mark, I have no idea. This is what sine looks like. That's all you need to know. This is what cos can be written like. Again, it's fine. It's just how we define the mathematical function. And this is the exponential function. And the reason I've written the exponential function is if we look back at Euler's equation, we have e to the power of something here. And this is what's going on over here. Knowing these three functional forms for sine, cosine, and exponentials, just seemingly unrelated, what Euler actually spotted by just looking at them was that you can write all three in the same equation. So to start with, you could maybe think, well, if we add cos and sine, then you get all the correct powers of x. You know, you get 1 plus x plus x squared and x cubed, x to the fourth, x to the fifth. And that's what you've got in your exponential. It doesn't quite work because there's some minus signs floating around. But this is where i comes into it because i times itself, i squared, is minus 1. So every time you have a minus sign, you just need an i squared term in there. And this is what Euler spotted. So if you actually write these out as cos of x plus i times sine of x, adding these two together now, you don't quite get e to the x because these are all pluses and these have got some minuses in. But what happens is, if instead of x, you take this to be i x, so wherever there's an x, just replace it with i times x, we can do that. And now, if you add all these terms together, you get exactly e to the i x. And this is what Euler spotted, and this is so important because it relates cos and sine and triangles, trigonometry, to the exponential function, which is all about growth and growth rates, rate of change. So things that just seemingly are so, so different, Euler showed they're the same, and they can be written in this format, in this equation. And Euler's identity is just a special form of this equation, because here, this is what e to the i x equals. So if you just put x equal to pi, then you get Euler's identity. For our third and final layer, stripping back Euler's identity, we're going to think about what it means geometrically. Because this equation, hiding underneath there, is just the unit circle. So a circle of radius 1. And to see this, first thing we have to think about is the, the graphs of sine and cosine. So we've got cosine at the top, cos at the top, sine underneath. The important thing is, these are defined mathematical functions, so we can work out their values, and they always lie between minus 1 and 1. So they both just kind of oscillate, wiggle around 0, always between minus 1 and 1. That's the key thing. And then the other thing we have to think about is what it means for a complex number or the imaginary numbers. So if you go back to probably your first ever maths lesson in primary school, you're counting, and you're counting along the number line. So, you know, you start one, two, three. It's like a one-dimensional number line. But when you've now got imaginary numbers, you can go across a certain amount with your real part, your real number. But then you can also go up or down according to your imaginary number. So instead of a number line, you now have a two-dimensional plane of numbers. So, like, you can think of it as a, a piece of paper that goes on forever, but it's two-dimensional. And what this equation here, Euler's equation, the general form of Euler's identity, what this equation is saying is how far you're going along the real number line is given by the value of cos, and then how far you're going along the imaginary number line, so how far up or down, is given by the sine bit, because there's an i there, and that gives you your e to the i x. And what you find is because cos and sine can only be between minus 1 and 1, this equation actually gives you 
a circle of radius 1 on your two-dimensional plane of numbers. The Euler's identity is just giving you one point on this circle when your angle is equal to pi, which is 180 degrees from your starting point. So we measure angles in the positive x-axis around 180 degrees, gives you exactly this point, which is minus 1. And of course, e to the i pi is equal to minus 1, so plus 1, and you get your 0. You get Euler's identity. But from just looking at that equation, you probably wouldn't know that it's hiding this beautiful geometry of the circle in the complex plane. And this is sort of why I wanted to like strip back the layers of this equation to really reveal the hidden beauty, the hidden complexity of the maths that's sort of underlying this very simple looking equation. So now hopefully next time you see Euler's identity, the most beautiful mathematical equation that exists, you will hopefully now understand just why it's so beautiful and not just be in awe of its beauty, but also the complex mathematical ideas that underpin such a simple equation. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to tune in for the next one. And of course, make sure you follow me. You can find me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Tom Rocks Maths. Thank you for watching.